folks. You know, you love them. That's right. We're going to be talking about bipolar molecular outflows from young protostellar objects, aka BMOFYSO, but Mejias. Don't think that was correct. Anyways, we're just going to call them outflows for short. Now you may be wondering, what is an outflow? Because what are those bad boys, you know? They're just out there out flowing out, allegedly. Well, don't worry. Today we're going to answer what they are, where they are, how they form, why they form, who. To start off, we want to kind of start at the beginning of this entire journey, where we have a pre-stellar nebula. Protostellar? Pre-solar? There's a big ball of gas and dust out there. It's really big, not very dense. There's not much stuff in it. Sorry. There's a lot of stuff in it. Too much, in my opinion. There is too much stuff in that cloud. But don't worry, it doesn't all go to one place because throughout that cloud, there's gonna be little clumps of stuff or places where there's more stuff than there's other stuff. And those places, which we're gonna call cores, core, you know, they, um, they grab you together. Anyways, those cores collapse and go into the same spot. Um, well, as one of them does. Eventually, there's so much stuff in the center that as gravity goes and goes and goes, and all the stuff goes towards the center. Oh my God, Bing Bang Boom! You got a star. Protostellar, proto star, baby star. Not a star yet. It's not actually bringing anything. And all that other dust and crap and stuff in this core. Well, not all of it, but a lot of it. Uh, it's also trying to get around the star, but it's, you know, things are falling and all that, and because things are radiant, it's falling. It's falling. As things start to fall in under the influence of gravity, they start to form a disk and spinning up, and the star is spinning. That can be covered in more detail, but that's not what this presentation is about. So as this disk forms around this baby star, you're spinning, everything's spinning, and everything seems to be going quite well with this young protostellar object and its newly formed accretion disk, except for one small issue, the conservation of angular momentum. See, the issue is that if we just look at the disk, the planets, the star itself, all of the stuff that fell into that, and we look at how much they're, you know, how much momentum they have as they're spinning around and around and around, oops, uh-oh, something's not right. Momentum doesn't seem to quite be conserved, oops. But that's not allowed. We can't do that. That's against the law. So we have to figure out where the momentum went because it has to go somewhere. So where is it going? What's the answer to this? It's not the disc, it's not the fan, it's not the star, it's not aliens, probably. Oh, I'd be low. It's probably aliens, someone tell him. So what does answer this question of the conservation of momentum apparently not being conserved very well? And the answer is outflows. You might be asking, well, Anna, what's an outflow? Outflows are large structures that are coming out of either of the poles, aka the top or bottom, of the little tiny baby stars in their early little stages of formation. These outflows are large structures of gas and dust that are getting swept away from the star by what is known as the stellar wind, which is a flow of gas away from the young star and its disk, just sweeping out across space like a lovely little breeze, like a big wind on a summer's day, but in space. But let's go a bit more into detail on these little outflows. So they kind of have three different regions if we look at it in terms of velocity of, you know, the stuff. On the very outside, you along at a literally 10 kilometers per second, you have a large outer shell. It's kind of in this little conical shape if you didn't know how to draw a cone very well. And it's, you know, it's, yeah, makes sense. The very outside, the slowest part of this is the large shell of gas and dust that has that the stellar wind has swept up and away from the star into two big lobes with their little points, their, their tips, on the star coming out of either pole. They can best be thought of as large cavities or holes being carved in the surrounding gas and dust by the star. Basically, the star is sitting in that, that core, that cloud that formed it. There's still a lot of stuff around. There's still a lot of gas, there's a lot of dust, there's a lot of other stuff like gas and dust. I love gas and dust. It's all there is, apparently. But basically, the stellar wind is carving away and blowing away and sweeping away all this stuff and pushing it, carving out this hole in the gas and dust. And the edges of these shells are the boundaries of how far the stellar wind has, has cleared out and pushed material as over, over the time of its existence. Inside these shells, we have the other two regions, which are divided into the slightly faster part and then the fast part. The slightly less fast part is kind of just it's the inside of the shell, except for the center. Um, it's just kind of the, most of the volume of it, which is occupied by a low density gas that is being deposited in the, that area by the central jet and the stellar wind. 
this region is boring, I don't like it, there's nothing happening there, and this is the last time I'll talk about it. And then we have the actual fun part, the fast part, the zoom part. It's going along real fast, it's like 30 to 50 kilometers per second. And it's a big old jet, it's a big old beam coming right on out of the two ends, no, two poles of the star. So let's look at this jet a bit more closely. When we look at it, we realize that when I said earlier there was a beam, I was lying. I was not telling the truth. Looking at the central jet more closely, you can see that it isn't a solid compact beam like you might guess. Instead, you see clumps that are arranged in a line along the jet and are mirrored on both sides of the star. And these clumps were initially called Herbig Haro? Hero? Herbig Haro? Herbig Dash Haro? H-A-R-O. They were originally called Herbig Haro objects after the people who first saw them. But as we look closer, they're not really objects at all. As part of starts creating material, the stellar wind is blowing outward from its surface. We'll get to kind of the details of this in a bit. But some of that is getting shot out of the poles very, very quickly in a very concentrated, highly collimated, I don't know that word because it's like a column. Collimated means very column-like. Because you ever seen a column? Very column-like. Very collimated. So these stars are sending out this very, very fast gas very quickly out of the poles, but they're not doing it constantly. They're actually doing it in periodic burps. You know, they're baby stars. They love to burp. Babies love burping. Is that true? I might have made that up. Are you supposed to, are you supposed to burp babies or something? So they don't build up gas. <laughs> I'm never having a child, don't worry about it. So as these stars are shooting out periodic burps of high velocity gas, that high velocity gas is just shooting out and then discovering that there's actually stuff in its way that's not going that fast. So this supersonic clump of gas shoots out and then rams in to the slower gas out there and smacks right on into it. That's a shock. It creates a shock because two, it's a fast thing hitting a slow thing and they're both fluids and they hit at supersonic speeds. It turns out that it makes a mess. But the shock means that, I mean, there's two shocks happening. It's called an internal working surface. So basically, fast gas hits slow gas. Slow gas gets sped up. So fast gas gets slowed down. But what's happening in the middle there? They, they just hit. Well, there's a lot of energy right there. A lot of, a lot of force, a lot of stuff happening when two things collide at supersonic speeds and also the two things are like clouds of gas the size of Earth's orbit. And a lot of stuff is happening there because they hit so hard that they can destroy the dust. They can dissociate molecules. They can just make all sorts of messed up stuff happen. And woo, shocks. And when they make all those things happen, we can see that because they glow. And you can imagine with this. Basically, as that dust is being destroyed and bleh and then bleh, chemistry happens. Now, I hate chemistry. I do not like it. I don't understand it. It makes no sense to me. And I think that those little letters are the devil's work. However, chemistry does happen in those shock fronts. And what that chemistry does is create SiO, silicon oxide. I had to think about that one. Silicon oxide. And it makes them ionize. So we have these glowing silicon oxide emissions that we can see as well as just you know a bunch of other hot stuff and shocks glow because they're shocking so in these jets fast gas hits slow gas they create shocks and some of it slows down some of it speeds up and shoots outward in a big collimated jet away from the poles of the star and we don't really know why the star burps periodically like this at least i couldn't figure out why i looked at a lot of papers and they said a lot of things and i'm not gonna lie i did not understand why they happen periodically but anyways, as these little periodic groups to go out, fast gas hit slow gas, slow gas speed up, fast gas slow down, stuff goes out, and there's your jet. But th that's not all that's happening here, because as these fast things hit the slow things, they go like this, and then splat. They hit and then splat. They splat. They splat out there. Now one of the papers I read described this as the gas squirting out from the sides in a, you know, bow shock pattern around the, the impact which is because the force forces some of it outward to the side to conserve momentum so they go splat they go splat out to the side and some of that material from the jets goes out into the rest of this outflow and we think that's where a lot of the gas in these outflows comes from there's just stuff that got squished and splatted in the jet and then it got squirted out and there's also some theories suggesting that these jets were power of the entire outflow including those big shells is that the momentum from these jets gets transferred to the shells as they splat and go and go and go. It eventually grows these jets around them. So how 
do these outflows form then? If the jet isn't the only thing powering, or if even if it is, what's making these jets? What's making these shells? For that, we turn to a theory called the X-wind theory. This model for outflow formation says that strongly magnetized stars with very large B fields, B stands for magnet, by the way, when they have a strong B field, it, is, it can actually cut off the accretion disk before it touches the star. Truncate is the word which I love. I love the word truncate. They truncate the disk. They truncate the disk and all the material from that disk is streaming onto the star through along magnetic field lines, but it doesn't have the spinning anymore. It's not spinning the star up. This actually prevents the star from getting spun up by the accretion disk and slows it down through magnetic torque, which is good because if the star isn't getting spun up by the accretion disk, it doesn't reach what we know as breakup speed, which is where the star tears itself apart through centripetal force. The stellar wind is still getting launched by this star and this and the disk. So that as the stellar wind is getting launched from the star and the inner edge of the disk at the X spot, by the way, the little addendum, the X in, in X wind, I had to dig through eight papers to find where this was defined. What do you think the X stands for? I'll give you 1.3 seconds to guess. Incorrect. It stands for extraordinary. It stands for extraordinary winds because someone looked at these and went, damn, those winds sure are cool. Anyways, so this says that as stellar wind is getting launched from the star and the inner edge of the disk, the original stellar wind getting Magnetocentrifugally, magnetocentrifugally accelerated. Astronomers love to put magneto in front of anything they can. Astronomers love magnetos. But anyway, so if we use this magnetism and these magnetocentrifugally accelerated winds and look at the disc winds in combination with the winds coming from the star itself, we can then see somehow this implies that um, a jet forms. But I think basically the B field just kind of forces all of the stuff, stuff up onto the poles of the star, which it launches, and it takes angular momentum with it. And also then there's the solar wind getting blown out from the sides at a very wide angle. And this wide angle is actually what's forming the shell, because these wide angle ones start blowing out and out and out, and they carve out that much area from the surrounding gas. But the jet is being shot straight out from the poles of the star is very, very complicated, very focused, and isn't clearing out all that stuff. But this is the only theory that can currently explain both the shell and the formation of the jet. Good theory, everybody. So you got your X winds, you got your disc winds, you got your star winds, you got your magnetocentrifugally accelerated winds, and all of this helps to take angular momentum from this entire system and shoot it out. This is how outflows are helping our angular momentum problem because the, all the material that's shooting out from these poles is getting launched through the disc winds, all the stellar wind is taking away tons of mass and momentum from the system, meaning that we don't have to account for all of the momentum from the original cloud and core. We just have to look at what's there already and then the rest of it got blown out into space with all the mass that's lost. Yep. Bipolar molecular outflows. That's that's what they are. There you go. Hope, hope you enjoyed. I don't really know how to end this video. Like, comment, and subscribe. Um, bye.